Welcome to Behavioral Health Champions, which is an exciting new series where we have a chance to talk with California lawmakers about issues related to behavioral health. Behavioral health policy, we talk about the issues of stigma, and we talk about how behavioral health challenges affect all of us and our families and our friends. I'm Carmela Coyle, and I'm President and CEO of the California Hospital Association, and I'm here with my colleague and friend Jessica Cruz, who is CEO of the National Alliance of Mental Illness California. Now, as we said earlier, behavioral health affects all of us, young, old, rich, poor. One in four individuals uh, has to address a behavioral health challenge in their life, and half of us will end up caring for someone with a challenge with mental illness. When we talk about behavioral health, we're talking both about mental illness and substance abuse disorder issues. We're so excited because joining us today is Assemblymember Marie Waldron. She represents the 75th District in California State Assembly. So we thank you so much for joining us today and for joining our list of behavioral health champions. So we'll just go ahead and jump right in. Okay. So you have been a local business owner for about 25 years, and you served on the Escondido City Council for 14 years. Yes. Can you give us a little bit about your background and kind of why this issue means so much to you? Well, serving in local government um, really opened my eyes to a lot of issues that affect, you know, our constituents in the districts, things that people are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Being in local government, we were much more in tune and, and close to our constituents. Um, when I came up to state government, it was very different because, you know, the decisions we make, sometimes we don't see the results of those back in the district or how they impact people directly. But what I did gain from being here in the state level was more exposure to health and um, serving on health committee really opened my eyes to issues that we didn't deal with in local government as much on the city council. So um, to me, it was fascinating. It's bipartisan. We can work on issues that really affect people's lives in a day-to-day -day way and help people you know, to achieve a better quality of life. So I'm very excited about that. And, and the more we learn about the issues, especially the co-occurring um, you know, issue with mental health as well as substance use disorder, you know, that's a whole area that the state needs to do a lot more work. Absolutely. So let me ask, your record um, and all of your work in the area of behavioral health is so impressive. Uh, your work as it relates to opioid safety, mm -hmm. um, mental health treatment, you serve on the Mental Health Caucus. Talk a little bit about What's driving this interest for you, um, your, your values, how you really came to this issue of behavioral health that we're wrestling with? Okay. Well, one of the things that really struck me <clears throat> is I felt like in a lot of ways in health, there's a two-tier system. So if you're on Medi-Cal, you know, how do we get people in Medi-Cal to have the opportunities to access the best and most innovative treatments you know, that people maybe on a private insurance or who can afford it also have. Because, you know, I look at it as if you're a single mom, you can't speak English, but yet you want to advocate for your child. But how do you navigate a system that's so complicated to begin with? And then you talk about, you know, how mental health issues and even addiction start at such an early age. You know, what do you as a parent, you know, since I'm a parent also, you know, you look at what are the, the things you look for? What are the signs? Where do you go from there? You know, how do you even start to navigate a system that's so complicated? And if you're in Medi-Cal, you know, what options and treatments are available to you? Mm -hmm. So to me, that's um, one of the things that really gives me an incentive to work on this issue and then the deeper you get into it, the more you see, you know, you talk about people who are incarcerated and the high percentage in there who are dealing with substance use disorder as well as mental illness mm -hmm. and the lack of um, treatment and um, services in not only prison but now jail where folks are being realigned and spending a longer time. Um, also, my area has a high tribal um, population. I have eight tribal governments, and we find that opioid 
um, substance um, use is higher in tribal governments than in the normal population, almost double. So that's an issue that a lot of people are not aware of. Well, and you've done some some work with the Stanford Five Year Initiative mm -hmm. with neuroscience. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and maybe some top takeaways. From sure. It. I'm. I was so excited. I guess it was about two years ago. Um, Dr. Wood and Dr. Arambula are also uh, participants in the. It's called the Stanford Initiative. It's a five year effort. Um, it's actually global, and they're looking at the link between addiction and the brain. Um, they want to bring researchers together with policymakers so that when we look at what types of bills to put forward or legislation that it's actually based on science and they've really found um, a, obviously a strong link between the brain and addiction. Um, they've looked at you know how do we treat addiction? How are we treating mental illness? It's actually a health care issue, and we don't look at it that way. We look at it more as a criminal thing or, okay, we'll put people in an asylum. That's how the stigma always came up. It's, oh, it's hush-hush. We can't talk about it. But we should be treating it just like any other health condition, especially mental health being a chronic condition exactly. that we can treat. We may not be able to cure, but if we can make it more mainstream, that you know, people will be able to get treatment. They'll be able to, um, you know, live a, a better quality of life. Um, that is a big part of it with the Stanford Initiative. They have analyzed the brain, the chemical imbalances, and they see that, you know, it's just our outlook and how we're addressing it that really makes the difference between our patients getting the right care. Well, and our coalition talks about that issue all the time. Um, we tend to be catching people when they're in crisis mm -hmm. and not doing what needs to be done in terms of prevention and early intervention, as an right. example, to keep people from falling into crisis. Mm -hmm. So Jessica and I have the pleasure of co-chairing the Behavioral Health Action Coalition. We are 50-plus statewide organizations, all of whom touch the issue of behavioral health in some way, or another, you've talked, mm. it's not just a health care issue, but whether that's the uh, criminal justice system, police, it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, all of us trying to work together. Right. One of the things that unites this coalition is that we treat diseases of the brain differently than we treat diseases mm -hmm. of the body. Right. And really this frustration that we have with a fragmented delivery and financing system mm -hmm. for behavioral health issues versus physical health mm -hmm. issues could you talk a little bit about your views of that mm -hmm. sort of different system yes. and how we yes. bifurcated Well, things? it's a parity issue, definitely. Um, I speak to citizens in my district who have, you know, family members. One of the biggest problems is we don't have, within the workplace, within our structure, um, the same type of protections that we do for disease states. You know, you take AIDS, HIV, and the privacy protections there. Um, when we talk about, you know, how are people in the workplace going to be able to step forward and say, I need help, you know, without worrying about their personal, you know, case being put in their file. I mean, one of the biggest drawbacks, I think, there's when we talk about obstacles, is... Um, gee, if I step forward or I report that my child, even high school age, needs to get treatment, is that going to be something that follows them through their life because it doesn't have the protections that a disease would have and, you know, health care um, treatments mm -hmm. because it's considered mental and then it's always on their file and will impact them in the future if they try to go for a position you know, say in public safety or in the military or anything like that, you know, just because they sought out care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the parity issue, how we're treating mental illness versus physical. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to parents who had adult children, they're 25, who had substance use disorder with some mental health issues. They are unable to access information on their own child, even though they're adult, 
you know, they're in a, maybe assisted outpatient treatment, but they are caretakers. They are people who are vested. They have a concern for their family member, and they can't access and help. And, you know, I've heard story after story after story where they drop off and they're, they, you know, die because they just don't have people who are, know what's going on. So we have, you know, issues like that that we have to deal with. And, you know, the way we have that complicated system in our healthcare right now, you know, how do we, we almost need an ombudsman like we have for health in general to help people navigate in mental health. And we don't have that available. And, you know, there's so many similarities in that we have a lack of workforce. Um, you know, those are some of the things that I've been working on and I know Senator Bell and others have been working on trying to increase the workforce uh, for counselors and mental health. And, and if I may, one of the things we've been talking about around our coalition table is we need to think about a different kind of workforce, right? A, an innovative workforce and maybe positions that don't exist today. Mm -hmm. Back to our conversations, how do we keep people from falling into crisis? Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in a hospital setting or in mm -hmm. a jail setting. It has to happen in the community. Mm -hmm. And where is that support system mm -hmm. for communities and families to really put their arms around and support individuals to help them um, mm -hmm. stay well uh, when at all possible? Right. Yeah. It's true. In the school system, yeah. you know, it's... And we're at a tipping point kind of, right, in mm -hmm. California because we're talking about the issue. But do you think that we're on, like, the right path or the wrong path when it comes to having kind of a, a coordinated care system for mental health in California? <laughs> well, I, I think what shocks me the most about health in general in our state is how not, I mean, not coordinated, not progressive, not um, thinking out of the box that they could be. When you look at other states and some of the things they're doing that are innovative, you know, a lot of times we get pushback. Um, I, I think we recognize, we've been talking, I've been seven years in the legislature and we're still talking about the same things and the access to care and lack of providers and the training and the certifications for, you know, a new workforce for mm -hmm. mental health. Um, it's ongoing. And at some point we have to make the tough decisions and get working on it. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about it a lot, but then bills go and they go to a probes and they die. You know, and all of our education efforts, all of our, you know, funding efforts. Yeah. And we have this history in the state of these sources of financing that also tend to mm -hmm. silo individuals mm -hmm. who are in need of care. Mm -hmm. So if you've got one particular type of condition, you're, you're down this route. Mm -hmm. um, if you have both a physical and a behavioral health need, you're just in trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so it's, it's one of the right. really challenges. And some of, the to some of the time, I mean, we bring people in, even if it's in assisted outpatient treatment, and once again we have just so many barriers and hoops that you have to go through to even get to that point. Sure. Then we're looking at, you know, a 30-day window or, you know, whatever it is, very short, not enough time to get people on the road to full recovery, which is one of the things the Stanford Initiative is really mm -hmm. advocating for is that we can actually get people to recovery if we let it go enough time and actually offer that full treatment. Not just to recovery, but sort of through recovery, right? right? Where exactly. And back to those community supports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if I may ask, um, as we mentioned, we spend a lot of time in the Behavioral Health Action Coalition talking about prevention and early intervention. Could we ask your view, how important is it for the state of California to invest in prevention and early intervention? It's critically important, just like any other health condition. Um, prevention is definitely uh, a, not only cost saving but a quality of life issue for people. Um, I'm very much in, involved in data driven medicine um, and personalized medicine and a lot of the new innovative ways to look at healthcare. And um, prevention is one of the key parts of that because, you know, we want to look at data and see, you know, what. What are some of the 
the things that we need to look out for for an individual, knowing their history or their gen genetics even, um, so that we can be ahead of it and prevent, you know, the costly aspects of treatment. As, and I don't mean just money, monetary, uh, the cost to the person themselves, mm -hmm. and what they have to go through in their family and, you know, loss of work and, you know, just their general quality of life is really something. But then when we start to talk about things like that here, it's like, oh, you know, the costs, they don't understand how the costs, you know, up front we might need to spend a little more, but in the long run we're saving. Right. And that's one of the things I've worked on here in my time in the legislature, I've had legislation that I had to keep bringing back. It finally got signed that the, um, we looked at uh, having a longer outlook on how we budget in health, you know, just because a lot of times the savings to the patient come later than just a 12-month look. Yeah. So, I think with mental health, behavioral health, it is kind of that long game, right? It's a chronic mm -hmm. condition mm -hmm. that we have to treat as such, mm -hmm. the same way as diabetes. Right. You know, we would never tell somebody they can't have their insulin because you know they're not covered. Or, right. You mm -hmm. know, we wouldn't let people get to the point of crisis mm -hmm. if they had a physical yeah. health condition. Right. So it's it's mind-boggling that we allow people to get to the point of crisis mm -hmm. when they have a behavioral health condition. Yeah, and I think one of the big um, the big areas that we had overlooked uh, for a long time was youth yeah. because, you know, it's that adolescent, those years where they're most vulnerable to not only substance use but also mental health right. Yeah, the first issues. signs and symptoms, symptoms come at 14. Mm -hmm. and, and we I, often ignore those, right, do. for yeah. years until oh, it's it just gets a teenager. so bad. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And, and then it's harder to catch. And then they have yeah. to go into a crisis when they're off at college or, mm -hmm. you know, 18 to 24 is when they have their first psychotic break. And by that point, it's been an 8 to 10 year gap mm -hmm. of getting treatment. Mm -hmm. We have to start to shift that a bit. So right. You can tell we're passionate about this <laughs> yes. issue. And we're so happy that you are too. And honestly, the work that you're doing is incredible. It's always so wonderful to have like-minded um, leaders helping our state, we as a coalition are the leaders within our respective um, fields. How can we come together and help you move this issue forward? Well, definitely the dialogue is important. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's a bipartisan issue. So it gets a lot of uh, the assembly members and the senators talking about it. Um, Meeting with groups, um, it's always helpful, you know, your coalitions to speak with us and educate us um, because, you know, as legislators, we're by no means experts. We're not out there in the field on a day to day basis, you know, dealing with the issues and with the patients. And, you know, one of the big things that would help us is how do we overcome some of the barriers? Yeah. You know, we talk about stigma and, oh, we need to talk about it more, but it kind of just, that's as far as it goes, you know. Public service announcements are helpful to get people to start to talk about it, just like we are beginning to talk more about substance use disorder. So mental illness and behavioral health is oftentimes not treated as a disease. Can you share with us some innovative ways that you see treatment for behavioral health? Well, one of the things uh, I think that would really be effective is the fact that primary care physicians are the first line of seeing people when they come in, you know, for even an annual checkup. And if they are attuned to looking for the signs of mental illness, they can maybe help open that discussion um, to possibly having treatment or trying to figure out or talk to the family members about what signs they may have seen. And opening that discussion is really important and could be a way that we could bring people into care sooner before it gets to be a chronic, you know, very obvious problem. And then this way we keep people in their, maybe their job, in their marriage, or even in school, depending on the circumstance, before it gets too far along. 
Um, one of the other things that I've heard a lot more about in the last year or so is first responders and the issues that they have with mental illness just because the culture that they have is that they need to be tough and otherwise they don't belong in their field. So we have various services that have started up, um, including the, the um, it's called the Iverson Foundation for Active Awareness, mm -hmm. which was named after Corey Iverson, the Cal firefighter who, who was from my district who mm -hmm. died uh, battling the Thomas Fire. And his widow, Ashley, has started this foundation. It's basically a peer-to-peer -peer, mm -hmm. um, program that they can talk to each other and acknowledge, you know, the concerns and fears that they have, mm -hmm. and that it's not uncommon. And we uh, saw a study that said, I think about half of police officers know someone in their field who has either committed suicide or thought about it. Mm -hmm. So it's a very widespread issue. There's a lot of stress in that, that industry, and, um, you know, we need to be aware of that as well and be supportive. And, and to your earlier point, how do we take advantage of that primary care visit? There's been talk about can we embed mm -hmm. psychiatrists, psychologists, to create a partnership, mm -hmm. uh, and even something like mental health first aid. How mm -hmm. do we take advantage of everybody in the community, not necessarily right. trained professionals, right. to look for the signs and symptoms and encourage people to mm -hmm. get the help they need. Right, it's true. Okay. Could we get your perspectives on stigma? I'd be interested in your thoughts, even within the legislature. Um, is it the same sea change we're beginning to see publicly? Are people more comfortable talking about this topic, or is there still stigma attached to having this conversation? I think at this point there still is. I mean we look at the um, the rise in homelessness and you know people say well they're on drugs or you know it's a mental illness issue but yet we're not able to you know wrap our hands around the issue and start to solve it and you know we talk about people who and one of the things I worked on was Laura's Law and extending that so that it could continue. Just the whole barrier to getting counties even to sign up, getting people to actually get involved in it, um, looking at how do we um, encourage folks with mental illness to actually go into treatment mm -hmm. without forcing them in, you know, at the point where they're at a danger to themselves and others. So, um, you know, it's that conversation that we don't have enough of, mm -hmm. you know, um, people can point fingers, oh, they're homeless, they're mentally ill, and then, but what about their human dignity? Mm -hmm. And, you know, people who knew them before would realize that's not them, and if there's a way to get them into treatment, they become the person they were meant to be. Um, but there's so much attached to it, just like how AIDS, HIV, which is another area that I work on, um, you know, reducing that stigma takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, being able to realize that if we can get people into treatment, we can restore their quality of life, you know, that it's not something that is impossible for a lot of people. So, well, Jessica and I would like to thank you not only for your policy leadership, but in this conversation, um, just for your human touch and compassion on this issue. That is um, such a critical piece, we believe, to advancing this conversation. Um, thank you so much, Assemblymember Waldron. Um, thank you for your leadership. Uh, this is Behavioral Health Champions, uh, brought to you by the Behavioral Health Action Coalition. Um, we are so pleased to have brought together um, more than 50 statewide organizations to really see if we can uh, educate, elevate, and innovate mm -hmm. in the area of behavioral health, and we thank you for all you're doing. Oh, Appreciate your you. time today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks.